In 2020, American billionaire and Shark Tank investor Mark Cuban said Bitcoin, and by extension all cryptocurrencies, have no value. According to him, the world's biggest cryptocurrency is just a collectible, no different from a baseball card or art. Fast forward to 2023, and Cuban is one of the most visible figures in the crypto world, with huge investments in crypto. Unfortunately for him, things are coming full cycle, and it seems karma has locked its target on him. Scammers have hit Mark Cuban quite harder than the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he lost $870,000 overnight. Billionaire or not, that is a lot of cheddar to have drained off your wallet. But is there more to the story than meets the eye? Just how much do you know about the biggest shark of Shark Tank? What is the real reason why Mark Cuban lost $870,000? Stick with us to the end to find out. The MetaMask Hack In the same week that Frank Templeton filed for a Bitcoin ETF, PayPal got new features, and Telegram integrated the Ton wallet for its 800 million users. But bad news slapped Mark Cuban in the face. On September 15th, hackers cracked Cuban's wallet, MC Cuban, and stole $870,000 in crypto assets from the billionaire. Pseudonymous ex-user at Waz Crypto first tweeted the hack on September 16th before the media picked it up. Cuban's wallet had been inactive for five months, and the sudden withdrawal gave all the telltale signs of a hack, which Cuban would later confirm. Cuban was informed of the hack by the news agency DL News. According to him, the hackers accessed his wallet after he downloaded a MetaMask extension with some sh** in it. His MetaMask application crashed multiple times when he tried to open it, and while he secured his NFTs, he was oblivious to the attack on the wallet. The attackers had drained Cuban of different tokens, which include USDT, USDC, Polygon Matic, Ethereum, STETH, ENS, RARI, RARE, BIT, and AUDIUS. It is not the first time Mark Cuban is losing enormous money in crypto. In 2021, he lost an undisclosed amount in the Titan rumored rug pull. Although it might seem like just another bad day for another crypto top shot, a little trip down history reveals much more than first meets the eye. An Accident of Capitalism Capitalism is built on one principle. Those who provide the highest value get the highest rewards. What do Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and Elon Musk have in common? They created things that offered the highest value. Amazon, Tesla, and Microsoft were game changers. Unfortunately, the rule is broken sometimes, and the system raises a less deserving person into the billionaire club. Mark Cuban might have humble beginnings and did the dirty jobs that set him on the path to wealth, but it does not change the fact that he is a dark shade of gray. The 65-year-old might be more like the MetaMask hackers than you know. To give you a full picture, we'll give a short dive into Mark Cuban's college days. The Chain Letter Scheme Cuban was born to a Jewish working-class family and grew up in Mount Lebanon, a suburb of Pittsburgh. Being from a working-class family meant he had to learn how to work to pay his bills, which he did. He started his first business venture at age 12, and by the time he was faced with paying his tuition at Kelly Business School, he was ready. He gave disco lessons, ran a small unlicensed bar, and started a chain letter. It is the chain letter scheme that raises eyebrows. A chain letter tries to convince you to send the letter to a certain number of people, and those people also have to send it to others. The result is an exponentially growing pyramid that would eventually become too big to contain. In other words, a chain letter is a Ponzi scheme. However, we're not talking about a Sam Bankman Freed level fraud yet, but there is only a little difference between them. In fact, although a chain letter is usually smaller than a company-wide deceit, it is more diabolical. An FTX type of fraud is called an untransparent Ponzi scheme because investors had no idea that they were investing in a massive Ponzi scheme. They thought they were investing with a legitimate company. A chain letter differs since those who participate are aware of the scam. But why would anyone knowingly invest in a scam? To understand that, we need to understand exactly how a chain letter works. 
someone approaches you with an investment opportunity and provides a list of names and the pitch. If you send $5 to each of the first six people on this list, your name will move up one notch on the list every time the letter is remailed. Subsequently, after six iterations of the letter, your name will reach the top of the list and you will receive $5 bills in the mail from dozens or even hundreds of people, far exceeding your initial investment of $30. The problem with such a business model is that the number of people participating in it keeps growing exponentially. After nine rounds of iterations, you would need to recruit 10 million new people, each sending $5 of the chain to keep it afloat. After just three more iterations, you would need 13 billion new people to buy in, which is far more than the total population of the planet at that point. What ends up happening in practice is that the vast majority of participants reach dead ends. They spend $30 to buy into the plan, but they can't find anyone else foolish enough to invest after them. This results in the majority of participants hitting a dead end. The few people at the top of the pyramid, like Mark Cuban, make enormous amounts of money on the backs of hundreds or even thousands of victims at the bottom of the pyramid. Chain letters are inherently fraudulent, and participating in a chain letter can be a felony in some states, punishable by up to 18 months in jail. However, because this occurred so long ago, the statute of limitations has passed, and Cuban faces no legal consequences. There is no possibility of being prosecuted. In the GQ interview where Cuban reveals this, he tries to justify it as being needed for his tuition. He also insists that none of the people he made direct sales to lost money. But what about those they sell to? Cuban was simply victimizing others to achieve his goals. The Broadcast.com Era Selling chain letters is not the only time Cuban made massive gains by selling useless products, all at the buyer's expense. Remember Broadcast.com, one of Yahoo's business acquisitions during the dot-com bubble? In the late 1990s, linear television was the sole option for seeing sporting events. While this was good for nationally televised events like the Super Bowl, many smaller local games were only shown on local TV networks. Visiting another city would not allow you to catch a game featuring your hometown squad because you wouldn't have access to their local TV stations. In 1995, Mark Cuban joined AudioNet, which Chris Jabe founded. With Todd Wagner, the trio combined their love for Indiana Hoosier basketball and webcasting to find an alternative to linear television for broadcast games. The company paid for the commercial rights to broadcast local sporting events nationwide via the internet. In 1995, AudioNet became Broadcast.com with a single server and an ISDN line. By 1999, it had over 300 employees and made $13.5 million in second quarter earnings. You should not let the numbers fool you. Although Broadcast.com had gotten hundreds of thousands of users, it was losing huge money. Given the exorbitant price of securing commercial broadcasting rights, it is difficult to say whether or not its business model has any chance of succeeding. Nonetheless, it did not matter because the dot-com bubble was at its height, making it possible for a defective enterprise to attract investors. In 1999, at the height of the dot-com bubble, Cuban's company went public with an IPO on the NASDAQ. Yahoo, the biggest player in the internet industry, bought the company in just nine months for $5.7 billion, with Cuban earning $1.4 billion from the deal. Let's take it all in again, shall we? So, Cuban knew his company was losing money and would not be sustainable for long. He also knew his company was overpriced, but that was all business. He agreed to sell his money-losing company to Yahoo while knowing that Yahoo was grossly overpaying for it. Once again, he was earning massive returns on a useless product. Unfortunately, he was compensated in Yahoo stock rather than cash and could not sell his shares because of a lockup period in the acquisition contract. He would have to wait for a certain amount of time before selling. It was not a good deal after all. Yahoo's stock was almost as inflated as Broadcast.com's. Thus, the acquisition did nothing more than a swap of one overpriced company for another. But Mark Cuban found a way around it. Instead of selling, he bought and put options on Yahoo shares to protect himself against a potential loss. In the end, Yahoo's stock price fell massively when the dot-com bubble burst in the early 2000s, and Cuban could keep his $1.4 billion fortune 
thanks to the massive payout from his put options. Three years after the purchase, in 2002, Yahoo decided to shut down Broadcast.com because they could see no way to turn a profit from the company. Cuban could create a billion-dollar fortune without providing any long-term value by jumping in on the ground floor of the dot-com mania and selling at the correct time. He was not rewarded for delivering the highest value. He was the lucky exception to a foundational capitalism principle. The Iron Titan Crash Although there are always exceptions to the rule, exceptions eventually run out of luck. For Mark Cuban, it began with the Iron Titan Crash. On June 16, 2021, DeFi Project Iron Finance's token Titan entered a death spiral that saw it go from $60 to $0.000006. Its stablecoin Iron also fell from its peg and traded for $0.70, cents, a huge decline for a dollar-pegged asset. The collapse occurred less than a month after Iron Titan launched on Polygon. Ironically, it was the strategy that was meant to keep prices up that made it fail. When the price started declining, Iron lost its dollar peg. Like other algorithmic stablecoins, the price should have been restored once the pegging mechanisms kicked in, but the situation spiraled out of control. Per the pegging structure of the protocol, whenever the price of an Iron token is less than one US dollar, anyone could purchase Iron tokens and exchange them for a total of one dollar in value consisting of 75 cents in USDC and 25 cents in Titan. Unfortunately, it only led to arbitragers taking advantage of a price drop to make a profit. The value of Titan tokens crashed because they were constantly dumped onto the open market. And when more people tried to cash in their iron, widespread fear ensued. A bank run followed, with everyone trying to cash in their iron tokens simultaneously. The price of Titan came under constant selling pressure until it fell to zero dollars. Mark Cuban was the biggest investor hit by the collapse. He had written a blog mere days earlier, giving his support to the crypto and had invested an undisclosed amount in it. But you can bet it is in the millions. Given his influence, his post drew the interest of several investors who bought chunks of Titan. Sadly, they learned the hard way what comes with blind support. After Titan fell to zero dollars, Cuban tweeted that he got hit like everyone else and called for regulations in the crypto space. Hold on, regulations? Although you can argue that he is correct, it is terrible timing. Calling for regulations after what seemed like a rug pull, in all honesty, is like insisting a gambling center be shut down after a disastrous night in Las Vegas. For a man whose wealth is built on getting much for nothing, it only seems like fair play when the tables are turned. Nevertheless, it was an unfortunate incident as investors lost millions in the crash. Conclusion The MetaMask hack was possible because Mark Cuban had downloaded a clone version of the trading application. Although it was unfortunate, the hack is only the culmination of events dating back to Cuban's chain letter scheme. Luckily, the hackers missed Cuban's $2.5 million worth of USDC, which was successfully transferred out of the account. Hopefully, we are not witnessing a pattern that could spell the worst for the billionaire. <laughs>